As I meditated upon this text that is before us this morning, another passage of Scripture came to my mind. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Corinthians and recalling his ministry among them, writes this. He says, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That verse makes Paul's point rather plain. The idea is that the cross of the Lord is absolutely central to his life and to his preaching. Not only was it central to his preaching, but it was also central to his personal walk with Christ. It doesn't say, the verse doesn't say, I just simply resolved to do nothing except preach Christ and him crucified. It says, I resolved to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. When Paul is writing about knowing Jesus and Him crucified, he's talking about something, he must be talking about something more substantial than simply knowing the name of Jesus. Or knowing that He died on the cross. He must be talking about an unrelenting passion to grow in His understanding and appreciation of Jesus and what took place on the cross. That's his every moment, every waking moment of the Apostle Paul is consumed with deepening his knowledge, his devotion, his love to Christ and his cross. From that I conclude that the apostolic view or the Apostle Paul's view of a growing capacity to comprehend the magnitude of the cross of Christ is essential to the Christian life. I mean, if that's all he wanted to know, if that's what his every moment was about, then it must be important to the Christian life. I would suggest to you this morning that we will never see Jesus as our greatest treasure, which by the way, is the way to have the greatest or maximum amount of joy in this life, uh, because Jesus, for all those who believe Jesus, will be our greatest treasure in eternity. But if we're going to experience that kind of joy and satisfaction in this life, then Jesus needs to be our highest treasure, and we will never have Jesus as our highest treasure, unless we aspire to understand the cross to a greater degree day by day. We will never hate sin as we should if Calvary occupies a small place in our hearts and minds. We will be far too attached to the things of this world and we will have little desire for the eternal glories that await the children of God unless we appreciate the magnitude of the cross. Why does Paul resolve to know nothing except Jesus Christ and Him crucified? Because growing in our comprehension of the cross is vital to the Christian life. That's why. Imagine beholding the glory of Jesus like climbing a mountain. Have you ever climbed a mountain before? Have you ever been out to the Rockies or, or maybe a smaller mountain, uh, maybe up in northern Ontario? There's not much in the way of mountains here in Essex County. The Albuna town line is about the best we've got. <laughs> you ever you ever done that before? You ever climbed a mountain? Just Just imagine that beholding or growing in your capacity to behold the glory of Christ is like climbing up a mountain. As we stretch our minds to go deeper into the inexhaustible truths of the person and work of Christ, we go higher up the mountain. Now along the way, as we climb that mountain, along the way, there are lookouts. You ever do that? I... I can remember Michelle and I were in Banff on one 
occasion and, and there was trails up a mountainside. And every now and again upon the trail, you can't see much when you're on the trail, but every now and again upon the trail you get to a lookout. And that gives you this amazing view. A view that you could not see from the lower slopes of the mountain. And at every lookout, so if this is beholding or increasing our capacity to, to appreciate the magnitude of the cross, is like going up the mountain and along the way we hit lookouts and we can look out and we can see more of Jesus' glory. But listen, at every lookout, there's another trail. And it's going farther up the mountain to another lookout to where we can see more of Jesus' glory. That, that's what thinking upon the cross does for the Christian. So we look upon the cross again and again and it leads us up the mountain, the spiritual mountain of giving us this capacity to see more of Jesus' glory. That's where we are in our text this morning. If you have your Bibles, turn there again. Mark chapter 14, verses 32 to 42. This is an opportunity for us to increase our capacity or our appreciation for the magnitude of the cross. There are three things in this text that should help us grow in our appreciation for the cross. Number one, Jesus' overwhelming sorrow highlights the magnitude of the cross. If the cross is a small event, then the turmoil of Jesus' soul makes no sense at all. I remember as a young Christian, Gethsemane, this garden seed, was one of the most mysterious things to my mind. It was mysterious because I saw the cross as a small thing. Only an event of massive proportion with eternal implications can explain the agony of Christ in the garden. Therefore, Jesus' overwhelming sorrow highlights the magnitude of the cross. You remember from last week that just before this scene, Jesus and His disciples had eaten the Passover. They had just finished the Passover meal. They had traveled a small a distance outside the city of Jerusalem. And here we find them in the garden and we find Jesus in spiritual agony. Verse 32, They went to a place called Gethsemane and Jesus said to His disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. In my commentary reading this week, studying this passage, I learned a couple of new things about the Garden of Gethsemane. First, I learned that the Garden of Gethsemane was on the lower slopes of the Mount of Olives. I, I, I don't know why I had never realized that before. I'd always kind of envisioned the garden being higher up the mountain, but in actuality, the, the uh, Garden of Gethsemane here is at the lower slopes of the Mountain of Olives. And so from where Jesus is praying, where He is in this spiritual agony, if He raises His eyes up to Jerusalem and from the, the Mountain of Olives, if you look straight up, you would see the, the wall of the temple. He looks straight up to the city of Jerusalem. In fact, we might, we might call this an uphill climb from where Jesus is in this scene. Now that is, a, that is a perfect picture of where Jesus is at spiritually. You know, you might say that where Jesus is at right now in His life, it's an uphill climb. It's a battle. There are, there are troubles. There are turmoils ahead. It's reminiscent of Psalm 20, 121, one of the Psalms of Ascent. They call it a Psalm of Ascent because that, those are the Psalms that would be recited as pilgrims would make their way up the hill into the city of Jerusalem. Do you remember how Psalm 121 begins? It says, I, I lift my eyes up to the hills. In other words, when I look on the horizon, it's uphill. And so the question comes to the psalmist, where does my help come from? 
Anybody can finish it? My help comes from the Lord, the Maker of heaven and earth. Right? That, that's Jesus in this moment. As He's at the, the bottom of the Mount of Olives and He's looking up to the, to the city of Jerusalem and He knows the trouble and turmoil. And what does He do? Look, we, we see what He's about to do. He says uh, that, that He's going to pray in the next few verses. So Jesus is looking up the hill and He's looking to the Lord. Another new thing that I learned about the Garden of Gethsemane this week is that the word Gethsemane, does anybody know what the word Gethsemane means? I, I did not know this uh, before this week. Sorry? Olive press. Are you cheating? Did you see that in the footnote of your Bible or did you know that off the top of your head? Lucky guess. That's amazing. <laughs> That's great. That's so fantastic. It means olive press. Which makes sense, right? Because here you have the Mount of Olives. Guess what's on the Mount of Olives? Wild guess. There's <laughs> olives there, right? And so at the, ba- at the bottom in this Garden of Gethsemane, and it's called Gethsemane because it means olive press, most scholars think, or many scholars think, that there is an actual olive press there. Right? You gather the olives from the tree and you bring it to the press. Now you have to understand that olive oil was a big staple in the ancient world, especially in Jewish life. They used it for all kinds of things. So this was a, a regular thing. And what you do is you would gather all the olives, or all the olives that were ready to be put into the press, you'd put them into the press, and then they are crushed or squeezed in the press to extract the olive oil. That, that's what happens. That's a perfect picture of what is about to take place to the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah gives us that picture in Isaiah 53, verse 5, writing about Jesus. He says He was crushed for our iniquities. So here we have illustrated in this place where Jesus is enduring this spiritual hardship, we have two pictures of the suffering that Jesus is about to endure. It's going to be a difficult road. It's an uphill climb. And then we see Jesus is going to be crushed. It's going to be broken for us. Mark emphasizes the distress of Jesus in the extreme. Do you see how great the emphasis is there in verses 33 and 34? Jesus says, or or Mark tells us rather, that He began to be deeply distressed and troubled. That's that's emphasis. It's it's trying to capture the the weight of the moment. It's not just that He's a, a little distressed or a little or a little troubled. He's deeply distressed and deeply troubled. Then you see in verse 34, Jesus actually says this Himself when He's speaking to His disciples, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. I've read the Gospel many times in my 20 plus years as a believer. And to the best of my memory, in all the other places in the Gospels, Jesus never speaks like this, ever, other than right here in the garden. We're told of Jesus' compassion. We're told that He's moved with compassion for people. We're told of, of Jesus' sorrow when, when Lazarus dies. But, but Jesus never uses this kind of language. The language of being absolutely distraught regarding what is about to take place. Which tells us something. It tells us that Jesus sees the cross, sees what He's about to endure as an enormous trial. I'll never forget one of my grade school teachers. I think it was grade 4. Maybe it was grade 5. I can't recall. Her name was Mrs. Carloni. Uh, If you know her, uh, I am not trying to slight her at all. This is just how I felt about the situation, okay? So don't be offended if you know her. And if Mrs. Carloni, if you're listening to this, you happen to be here, I have no malice against you at all. But I was terrified of that woman like you cannot believe. (laughs) Uh, Back in my grade school, they still had those little 
uh, short pieces of wood, you know, the wood dowel with the hook on the end so that you, they used them to open up the old windows. You know, they reached up to grab the handle and they pulled it down. Well, this, she would walk around the room and if you weren't paying attention, she would slam that thing down on your desk and just scare the life out of you. You know, she had more than once, I know you're finding this hard to believe because I'm such a tough individual, but she had more than once reduced me to tears. And I dreaded going to school every day because I was terrified of her. And I remember on a few occasions, uh, you know, faking sick or trying to get out of going to school because that's the last place in the world I wanted to be. Now, to my memory, I've not seen Mrs. Carloni since those days, but I suspect if I were to see her again today, I've actually kind of thought it would be kind of cool to go back to grade four and relive those moments, but I suspect she would not be nearly as intimidating to me today as she was then. You ever do that in your life? You make a bigger deal out of something than it actually is? You know, you think, you think your life is over, you think this is some great tragedy in your life, or you think there's some great trial, and then uh, like three years later, you can't even remember what it was. We do that from time to time, don't we? But did you know that that is impossible for Jesus to do that? It's impo- we do that all the time, but for Jesus, that's impossible. Jesus' humanity being perfectly united with His divinity means that He has at all times in His humanity, He has a perfect and complete perspective over absolutely everything that happens. Jesus never makes a bigger deal out of something than what is necessary. He never overreacts. He never makes something bigger than it actually is. So the kind of language that Jesus is using here tells us that the garden, as He anticipates the cross, is an extremely big ordeal. And if Jesus sees the cross as a big deal, then so must we. Satan loves it when people in the church try and portray the cross as a small event. He loves it because when the magnitude of the cross is diminished in the minds of people, the necessity of the cross is also lessened. Why talk about it if there's not much to it? Why plead with people to cling to Christ's cross for their salvation if nothing significant was accomplished there? I hear preachers say that the cross was just about Jesus setting a nice example for us of selflessness. If that's all it is, it's no wonder they don't plead with people to come to the cross. Satan loves it when Christians start to think along those lines because it leads to the eternal destruction of men and women. We must listen to Jesus here. We must hear the utter anguish in His voice. We must see Him prostrated upon the earth, pouring out His heart in turmoil before His Father. Jesus makes it plain as it can possibly be made here. The cross is an enormous event. So it doesn't matter one little bit what someone else might say. It doesn't matter uh, what they might say about the cross of Christ. Jesus' display of utter anguish here shows us that the suffering of the cross is an enormous historical event. And to characterize it otherwise is to be at odds with Christ Himself. Jesus' great distress at what is about to happen may raise the question in our mind. Here's the question that it might raise in our mind. Why was Jesus so troubled in His soul about dying? Many men and women of far less character than Jesus have faced dying without expressing such dismay. Nope. Godless people on occasion face death with with what appears to be little trouble. So why Jesus 
Why is he so troubled here in the garden? I mean, would you agree that Jesus knows the promises of God better than anyone? Jesus knows the promises of God better than anyone. Would you agree that Jesus knows the power of God better than anyone? He does. He knows. And He knows exactly what's about to happen. He knows that He's about to be put to death. And He knows that death holds no power over Him. He knows that His resurrection from the dead is certain. So why then is His suffering and dying such a big deal? Why is this scene of the Garden of Gethsemane in the Bible? For us to understand that, we need to do something. Here's what we need to do. We need to look beyond the visible suffering of Christ to appreciate the magnitude of the cross. Crucifixion, if you know anything about crucifixion, is without question a most torturous way to die. You basically suffocate to death is how you die upon a cross. But there is more here that we need to see. There is more than whips. There is more than thorns. There is more than nails. There is more than suffocation and humiliation. There is more that we need to see that causes Jesus such distress in the garden. We need to look beyond the visible, the visible suffering of Christ to appreciate the magnitude of of the cross. Again, we see the great distress of the Lord in verse 35. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. He falls to the ground to pray. That's an interesting way of putting it, I think. I kind of would have expected Jesus to kneel to pray, or sit to pray, or perhaps lay down to pray. Why say fall? Why does He fall? Because fall conveys the enormity of the spiritual weight that Jesus is bearing at this moment. It's a picture of the Lord being pressed into the ground with the great burden that is upon him he's known that this moment is coming three times we see in the gospel of mark he tells his disciples that he's going to die and be raised from the dead and yet even though he said that to his disciples three times what does he pray here he prays for the hour to pass from him he begins his prayer like this verse 36 abba father he said Everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Abba is an Aramaic word, and it means Father. And Mark puts that right next to you. So you have Abba, and then he puts it right next to the Greek word Patros, which also means Father. So if we were to translate this totally into English, it would be Father, Father. So Jesus is opening His prayer. What an amazing way to pray. It's an em- Why is it written twice? It's to emphasize the Father-Son relationship between God the Father and God the Son. It's to emphasize the closeness, the intimacy of their relationship. Their relationship is in fact, I would argue, the highest example of intimacy and love. And you see that displayed as Jesus begins to pray. And what does He pray? The Son who has honored His Father in absolutely everything prays, Lord or Father, everything is possible for You. Take this cup from Me. Yet not what I will, but what You will. Jesus knows God better than any other human being ever has. He knows and fully believes in God's unlimited power, right? That's what He says here. You can do everything as possible for you. You can do everything. And on the basis of God's unlimited power, Jesus says, take this cup. That's a, a metaphor for the cross. Take this cup. 
In his humanity, Jesus is saying, if there's any other possible way for God the Father to accomplish his purpose, then take the cross away. Surely there has to be more here than simply suffering and dying that makes this so agonizing for the Lord. The humiliation, the beating, the crucifixion, and ultimately the death are truly horrifying. They are. And we would do well to look on the horror longly. But we must understand that the horror that we see that's recorded for us in the Bible, the horror that we can see in the crucifixion is simply pointing us to something much deeper. Have you ever seen dark storm clouds on the horizon? I don't know if it was four or five years ago, but I remember I was out for a a bicycle ride here out in the county. And as I was making my way home, there were really dark clouds on the horizon. And the sky was turning quite black. And uh, I was concerned for myself. Uh, when I was riding because the storm was coming in. Now, now, when you look at the storm clouds on the horizon, is it the clouds that you're concerned with? No. It's what comes with the clouds. I was about maybe two kilometers away from home when the wind and the rain struck and I was getting pelted with, with rain and, and lightning was touching down in what seemed to be I, my perception was probably not that great, but it seemed to be really, really close. It wasn't the clouds that were fearful. It wasn't the clouds that were troubling. It was what came with the clouds that troubled me as I tried to ride home. And just like dark storm clouds tell us that there is something more coming, the cruelty of the cross tells us or points us to something much more Fearful that Jesus endures on the cross. Describing the suffering of the cross, Jesus calls it a cup. Take this cup from me. And by doing so, He points us to what that is. Bear with me for a few minutes as we turn to some passages in Scripture. If you want to follow along here, the first one is Psalm 75 Verse 8, Psalm 75, verse 8. Listen to how, what this verse says. In the hand of the Lord is a cup full of foaming wine mixed with spices. He pours it out on all the wicked of the earth. Or sorry, He pour, pours it out and all the wicked of the earth drink it down to its dregs. And flip over to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 51, verse 17. Isaiah 51, verse 17. Listen carefully to this verse. Awake! Awake! Rise up, O Jerusalem! You who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of His wrath, you who have drained it to its dregs. That, that's, a, that's the Bible's way of saying all the way to the bottom of the cup. And then Jeremiah, just one book over. Jeremiah 25, verse 15. Jeremiah 25, verse 15. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me, Take from my hand this cup filled with the wine of my wrath and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. So there is in the Old Testament the idea that a cup is used as a symbol for the outpouring of the wrath of God. That, I believe, is what Jesus is talking about here. You say, well, why do you think that? We'll carry on our journey through Scripture a little farther over in the book of 1 Peter. 
1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, we read this. This is speaking of Jesus. He Himself bore our sins in His body on the tree, that is, on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live to righteousness. By His wounds, you have been healed. That's about as clear as you get for saying that what Jesus is doing on the cross is He's taking our punishment. He's standing in our place. Over in the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verse 20, we read this. And through Him, again speaking of Jesus, let me back up to verse 19. For God was pleased to have all His fullness dwell in Him, that's Jesus, and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through His blood shed on the cross. Romans chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. Romans chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. But God demonstrates His own love for us in this, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from what? From God's wrath through Him. And then finally, in the Gospel of John, about the clearest example that I could bring to my mind, John chapter 3, Verse 36, listen to these words. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life. Why? For God's wrath remains on Him. Our sin, our rebellion, our disobedience to God rightly deserves the eternal wrath of Almighty God. And if you have never trembled at that thought, then you have never appreciated the cross of Christ. The only way God can justly remove His wrath, which is upon us as sinners, the only way He can do it is to place it on someone else. It's the only way God can remain both just and loving is if His wrath is placed on somebody worthy enough to satisfy the entirety of His wrath. That's what Jesus willfully submits to on the cross. I have a hard time fathoming the infinite, the infinite wrath of God against the sins of one person. That is, eternity in hell for one person. That's a difficult thing to wrap my mind around. How can I even begin to wrap my mind around the level of wrath required for the sin of the world? That's what Jesus is to endure on the cross. And that is what is such a great dread to His heart. What Christ is about to experience is completely foreign to Him. Never before would the Lord have ever had an inkling of dread with regards to the Father. Never before. His every thought and action had perfectly maintained the joyous fellowship between Father, Son, and Spirit for all eternity past. Never would would the holiness of God have been a, a cause of dread for Christ. It would have been from all eternity past a cause of of infinite joy. And now he has come to the moment where He is going to endure the punishment for our disobedience. He is to experience a multiplied eternity of God's wrath in a finite space of time which goes beyond the conception of our minds. That's the magnitude of the cross. That's what Jesus bears. He bears the wrath of God on our behalf. There is more to the death of Christ than the execution of someone by the Roman state. In that sense, the death of Christ is nothing particularly special. 
if all it is is a common execution by the Romans. The Romans killed people all the time in this manner. In fact, in, 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 in a few instances, they lined highways for kilometers or miles with people nailed to crosses. The ancient world was not a nice place to live. In fact, you may know, you probably know, that when Jesus died, there were two other people nailed to the cross at the same time. And so if all we see in the cross of Christ is His crucifixion, there is nothing particularly special about that. It happened to people all the time. But the cross and Jesus' suffering, it's not just about what we see in the implements used to bring about His death. It's what those implements are pointing us to what the horror of His death points us to, namely, the wrath of Almighty God. And apart from doing that, if we don't look beyond the nails and the cross and the whips and all that stuff, if we don't look beyond that, we're going to fail to appreciate the magnitude of the cross. There's one more thing that we need to see to see the magnitude of the cross. And then... And then we need to apply it. Once we be, hopefully we see more of it, and then we need to apply it. Here's the third thing. The loneliness of Christ exemplifies the magnitude of the cross. No mere human being could endure the cross precisely because its burden is far too great for anyone else to bear. Here, Jesus asks Peter, James, and John to come with Him as He praise so they're they're close enough the idea here is that peter james and john are close enough to hear what jesus praised all three of these men you may recall from earlier in the gospel uh, we just saw this with peter last week all three of these men have pledged to remain faithful to jesus even if it costs them their life they're going to stick with jesus no matter what you remember them all saying that you remember when uh James and John's mother came and said, Lord, let my son sit on your right and left. And Jesus says, can you drink the cup that I drink? That's the cup he's talking about, the cup of the cross, suffering. Can you be baptized with the baptism? And they're like, yeah, oh yeah, we can do it. Remember? And as Jesus' burden is so great, he calls these three guys aside and he says this. And then we we discover this in verse 37 and 38. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. They, these guys who had declared their faithfulness to the end, they can hear the agony as Jesus begins to pray. And they fall asleep. They fall asleep. William Lane pointed out something in his commentary to me that I had not seen in these verses before. I had often read these verses thinking that Jesus had brought Peter, James, and John with him because he needed some friendship. He needed some encouragement. But it's actually quite the opposite. And, and, and Lane points out in his commentary that Jesus does not ask His disciples there for His sake. But rather, he asks, them there, he asks them there and He commands them to watch and pray for their sake. What does it say? Did you hear? Did he, did he catch that? Verse 38, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. He asks them there. I, I've always read it the other way, but he's, he's, He asks them there for their sake. Now look again at verses 39 and 40. Once more, He went and He prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Can you relate to that saying? Their eyes were heavy? Have you ever felt like there's no possible way you can keep your eyes open? I can remember a few uh, late nights uh, when Michelle and I were just dating each other. She was living in London and I was living in Colchester. I can remember a few late nights of driving home and you just feel your eyes start to close, right? Now for me, there's only two solutions in that uh, situation. One, Dr. Pepper and M&M's. <laughs> or two, pull over to the side of the road and get some sleep. 
because you just can't keep your eyes open. And on more than one occasion, I had pulled into a uh, service center, and nothing will scare the life out of you more than sleeping in your car, waking up, thinking the car is still moving. That's totally terrifying. (laughs) These guys had just come from Passover dinner. Like, this is the meal of the year. The, The meal usually wraps up around midnight. And you just try and have Christmas dinner at 11 p.m. and see if you're still going strong at 1 a.m. It's just not happening, right? That's what you see here. They fall asleep again and again. Imagine the shame that they would have felt as Jesus comes and He wakes them up. I kind of envision Jesus giving Peter a little nudge with a sandal. Could you not stay up even one hour? What are we to learn from this? What are we to learn from the disciples falling asleep here? We're to learn that the disciples are weak and frail human beings just like us. That's one of the reasons we can trust the Bible, by the way, is remember the apostles, the disciples here, they're like pillars of the church, right? They're the heroes of the faith in the early church. And yet we get them with all their failures and all their shortcomings. Man, if, if people were making up this story, if this wasn't real history, they would whitewash all that. But we don't. We get, we get their weakness and we get their frailty. And then we read this in verses 41 and 42. Returning a third time, He said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Three times Jesus goes and He prays that the cup of God's wrath would be taken. Knowing all three times, knowing full well all three times that there is no other way to fulfill the plan of the Father to bring glory to His name, Jesus willfully submits all three times. Not what I will, but what You will. And after He prays, He comes and He checks on His disciples and He finds them sleeping all three times. We have seen on a number of occasions that the number three is an important number in the Bible and it's often used to express a maximum emphasis. So there are two things being emphasized here. One is the weakness of the disciples. Two is the resolve of Christ to fulfill the plan of God which was established before time began. We are told here, Jesus says, the hour has come. This is not a surprise to Christ. He knows it's coming. And He willfully submits to it. He doesn't run away, but instead He says, let us go. The hour has come. So we see here, where the disciples fail at every turn, Jesus remains faithful. It's not just the disciples that fail, by the way. Every human being in the history of the world has failed at some point. The disciples are merely accurate representations of what we all are. What does that tell us? What is the picture of the scene here in Gethsemane? What we see is we see Jesus alone. We see the loneliness of Christ. Because Jesus alone can endure what is about to come. Hopefully in our first two points, we have grown a little bit in our appreciation of the magnitude of the cross. How big must the burden have been to weigh so heavily upon the Lord in the garden? Can we even begin to comprehend the fullness of the wrath of God on Christ to bear the penalty for our sin? The degree of suffering in those moments is unimaginable to us. And yet we find Jesus resolving to endure it all, even though He must do it alone. Think about that. How great is the strength. How great is the character And how great is the love of Christ. You see, we cannot begin to appreciate the magnitude of the cross without also beginning to appreciate the glory of Christ. The opposite is also true, and we would be 
we would do well to beware of this in our own day. If we diminish the significance, the significance of the cross, we inevitably demean the Lord. It is impossible to try and diminish the magnitude of the cross without great insult to Christ Himself. Make sin a small thing and you ridicule the glory of Christ. Diminish the severity of hell and you mock the anguish of the Lord. This is why the Apostle Paul so passionately writes, we preach Christ. We preach Christ crucified. If we are to grow up in Christ, we must, we must strive to see the magnitude of the cross. Otherwise, this is the application of this. Otherwise, we will be of little value declaring His greatness and we will exert little effort and care in being conformed to His image. What do you see when you look to Calvary? Is it a small thing to you? Oh, I know that if I were to go around the room and I were to ask everybody, you know, what do you think of the cross? You would all say that the cross is very important. But what place does it really occupy in your heart? Are you astounded at the magnitude of the cross? Does it cause awe and wonder in your heart when you think upon its significance? I truly hope that it does. And I pray that in some small measure we will be able to better appreciate the immense magnitude of the cross from this text so that we might behold more of Jesus' glory. That is the only way that is the only way to make progress in the Christian life. That is the only way to conquer sin and to be made more like Jesus. That is the only way to have a burning, passionate desire for others to know Christ is to see the magnitude of the cross. Think upon what Jesus does on the cross. Let's pray. Lord, I'm, I'm troubled in my heart. I'm troubled in my heart because I don't have the wisdom or the words to convey to any great degree the magnitude of the cross. And so God, the prayer as I, my prayer as we close our time together, my prayer is a pleading for the, for the Holy Spirit to be upon each one of us. I need this. We all need this every day. God, help us to see. In Jesus' name, amen.